Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens-based forum where we look at in, uh, topics of interest to the Tri-Cities. And we'd like to thank Tri-Cities Community TV for helping us to make these interviews happen. Before we get started with today's interview, I just want to acknowledge that our interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Quiquitlam First Nations. And we thank the Quiquitlam peoples who continue to live on the lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So this afternoon, I am joined by Paul Lambert, who is taking a run for Coquitlam City Council. So thank you so much for joining us today, Paul. Thanks so much for having me, Nancy. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful to be able to sit down and have a chat and catch up. Um, I was wondering, for people who maybe don't know you yet, can you start just by giving us a little background about who you are and maybe share with us some of um, how you've been in, engaged in the yeah, community? For, for sure. So, uh, yeah, my, as, as you know, my name is Paul Lambert, running for City Council in Coquitlam. Um, so I ran in Coquitlam in 2018. Um, very challenging for, for any candidate to get elected the first time, and, and I knew that. Um, so I always knew it would take uh, probably two elections uh, to get on. So uh, this is a really exciting election. I've, I've been working hard in the community for the past five years, uh, starting in that 2018 campaign. So a uh, really exciting time to kind of be at the end of that five-year process and, and be able to be out there talking with you, talking with residents. Um, so a couple things about me uh, to start that I think are really important. So um, I'm a truly independent candidate for city council okay. so I'm nonpartisan uh, I'm not affiliated with any political parties um, I think that's very important. Uh, the second thing is I don't take donations from developers. So in 2017, the provincial government passed a law making it illegal for developers to donate to city politicians. Um, unfortunately, what happened was uh, those, those developers have shifted from making donations as companies to making donations as individuals. Oh, okay. So in reality, nothing's changed. Um, so in Coquitlam, a lot of candidates are still taking a high percentage of their uh, donations from developers. So um, I believe to be an independent candidate, you can't just be not affiliated with a political party. Uh, you also need to not take donations from developers to make sure that you're only looking out for residents. So those are two key things about me and my campaign to start. Um, and then, yeah, my involvement in the community. So um, started five years ago. Um, you know, I've been involved in different different capacities. I used to coach and, and things like that. I've coached high school basketball and middle school rugby in, in Coquitlam. I used to volunteer with the Canucks for Kids Fund for a long time, um, but then more recently um, I've sat on the Sports and Recreation Advisory Committee for the City of Coquitlam for the past four years. Um, for the past two years I've also sat on the Coquitlam Watershed, sorry, Coquitlam River Watershed Roundtable. Um, I work with a group called the Trine City Green Council, which is an environmental stewardship group. Uh, and I also uh, helped start a group called Protect Coquitlam's Urban Forest, or PCUF. Um, and, and the focus of that group is protecting tree canopy throughout Coquitlam. Um, so yeah, so the, I, I try and be a really balanced person and, and candidate. So I've done work in sports and the environment. I do a lot of work on housing. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, but last but not least, uh, I have a great passion for the arts as well. So I'm a musician. Uh, my dad is a wonderful musician, so he got me into music when I was younger. Uh, I used to teach music lessons in Coquitlam, and I still play in, in two different bands in the city. So. Wow, so it sounds like um, you're going to bring a lot to the council table. You've got, as you said, um, sports. You've got arts, um, you have a business background, and lots of um, environmental uh, background and um, belong to uh, several environmental groups. So um, I, I think it's, it's great to see you stepping up. Can you tell us why? Like what Thank, inspired yeah. you to take Thank that you. next step? Thank you. And you made me realize one thing I should mm -hmm. note, because uh, we talked about the other one side of things, but uh, my, my work is important. So mm -hmm. I'm a small business consultant uh, based in the Tri-Cities. So I help people start businesses, you know, entrepreneurs. Sometimes it's their first business. Sometimes it's their second or third crack at it. 
um, but I also come into existing businesses, help with problems if they want to try and grow. Uh, and then last but not least, I'll do sales and customer tr uh, service training and workshops. So I'll come in for a day, for a week, for a weekend, whatever a company wants uh, to do sales, customer service. And I'll also do corporate culture workshops as well. It's a real emerging uh, part of, of HR. So just wanted to make sure I got the, the, the work record out there as well. Yeah, so. and I, I can see already how some of those um, experiences would really benefit you as a counselor. Like For the, sure, yeah. There's a lot of skills um, that you've talked about and experiences that definitely those would transfer over. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I just really believe in being a balanced person, a balanced member of the community, and, and I think it's key to have a broad area of mm -hmm. experience and values and and uh, and involvement. You know, uh, yeah. to really to really understand the, the whole community. So. Yeah. So you said that you took a run in 2018, and then you said that this is sort of the end of a five-year. Yeah. Period. So tell yeah. us what you've been doing. How have you been um, preparing or what have you been doing since the last campaign up to now and um, continuing to do to c prepare for this election? For sure. Thank you. So, um, yeah, like I said, it's been a five year process. I campaigned for a year leading up to the 2018 election. And then uh, I've been campaigning off and on the last four years. Um, not every day, but uh, right. <laughs> off and on. And so um, I, I mentioned some of the groups I've been working with. So I'm on the Sports and Rec Advisory Committee. I work, uh, I'm on the Coquitlam Water, Coquitlam River, water, it's a tongue twister. It is a tough Coquitlam one. Coquitlam River yes. Watershed Roundtable. <laughs> um, and two different environmental stewardship groups. Um, but I'm a real advocate for accountability and transparency and awareness in the city. So I try to attend council meetings. I watch almost all of them online, especially during COVID. Um, so I tried to draw attention to different things that have gone on in the last four years. Um, we had some potential rezoning uh, things going on in the city. A lot of residents were very concerned about that. So right. I tried to give a voice to that, uh, even though it was kind of right in the middle of, of the four-year term. Uh, my approach is it doesn't matter when, if it's something important, I want to be involved with it um, and yeah, and su support the community and, and really listen to residents and, and right. what they're saying is important to them. Um, I just really believe in a bottom-up approach approach to local democracy instead of a top-down approach. So, so I think you mentioned that you'd been out doing some door knocking recently yeah. um, and you were saying how important it is to listen to residents. Yeah. Can you share with us some of what you've been hearing from them? Yeah. Um, what are the issues and what are people caring about? For right sure and, and that goes back to your previous question, you know, why am I running? Mm -hmm. And so the reason I, I started this whole process five years ago was just talking to neighbors in my neighborhood and a lot of people just weren't happy with, you know, Coquitlam's a wonderful place to live overall. It's right. far more good than bad by far. We're, we're fortunate to be here. Um, but a lot of neighbors had concerns and they felt like the city wasn't listening. And and they, they, they would give input when the city had an input process and right. they just felt like no matter how much input, what they said, how much time they spent on that email or that survey, that at the end of the day, the city was just going to do whatever they had so planned not to do. Heard. Yeah, in the okay. first place. So they're not feeling listened to. And so the top two comments I get from residents, and this is across Coquitlam, South Coquitlam, Town Center, North Coquitlam, no matter where you go, the top two comments are wow, we are growing a ton. Coquitlam oh, okay. is growing and developing like never before. Mm -hmm. um, and people are concerned that maybe we're growing a bit too fast. Um, but then right away, immediately say, they say, well, but we need to build new housing. Residents understand this, right? Um, but they, they always say, Paul, I'm not sure that the type of housing we're building is really helping. You know, ha right. We've been growing and building so much, but has it really been helping affordability? And I really agree with those two top concerns from residents. And so I, I think we need to slow down our pace of development and growth in Coquitlam. Okay, let's yeah. talk yeah. about... And then, um, and then focus on the type of housing that we're yeah. building. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, let's talk about that more, yeah. growth and development. Yeah. I think I heard you say that um, we need to maybe slow down a bit or to... Um, Think about it. Uh, uh, the absolutely, types of absolutely. That we need. And so I, I'm, I'm really proud of this. Uh, I think I'm the only candidate, to the best of my knowledge, who's saying, "Hey, I think we should slow down a little bit." Slowing down doesn't mean going to zero, right? right. It means going right. from 100 to 75. You right. know, slowing down a bit, getting back in control, and really focusing on the type of housing we're building, not just the quantity. Okay. 
And, and a key part of that is, I believe, if that's the top comment you were hearing across the city... There's an awful we, lot of growth yeah, out there. We and, see and it everywhere. For yeah. sure. And so we need to listen. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't believe that residents are wrong. You know, right. I'm, I'm not here to tell residents what to think or what to do or what we should do. I'm here to listen. And so my entire platform is based on that feedback from residents. Um, but we've got to be careful because we need new housing. We need mm -hmm. growth, right? So slowing down doesn't mean being ignorant and burying our heads in the sand. Right. It means slowing down a bit, getting back in control, and really focusing on the type of housing that we're building. Because right now we're seeing we're seeing a lot of growth and development. We're also in the midst of a housing affordability crisis. So it kind of brings up the question, are the types of developments that we're seeing right now, are they meeting the needs of residents or do you have some thoughts on the types of housing options that um, we should be seeing? A absolutely, absolutely. So residents are telling me clearly, you know, mm -hmm. for years, not, not just lately, that no, the type of housing we're building isn't meeting the needs of our community. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to break it down is, right, so before 2015 and 2016, when the affordability crisis really started and really got bad, mm -hmm. right, that's where things begin. And so to me, we have to start with young people and then build up, right? Okay because a lot of our more established families already have housing in right. Coquitlam. It's hard so, to get into the market. I yeah. think any young person can yeah. and, agree to that. And so I kind of look at it in five-year segments, right? Okay. So in our 20s, most of us, we rent to start out, right? So for a long time, we were hardly building any dedicated rental units in Coquitlam. Okay. And I think this was a real weakness of our housing policy for a long time. Thankfully, uh, we are building a bit more lately, um, but that's only come from people in the community, and, and I'm proud of this residents, or sorry, uh, candidates like myself and some others in 2018 really pushing that issue. So right. a bit of progress has been made, but we need more. So for, for people starting out, we need more dedicated rental because mm -hmm. house prices are very sticky. So a, a big part of my background is in economics and markets. Okay. And so I think people understand this intuitively, uh, but it's important to note that housing prices are very sticky. It's hard what for prices to come sticky? down. Yeah, it's difficult for them to okay. come down, right? It's easier for housing prices to go up okay. than it is for them to come down, right? Whereas rent, the rental market is more fluid. Some people are on a, a year lease, even a six month lease, you have more movement. Now, our rental market is incredibly expensive right now, but it's easier to impact the cost of rent. If we really have more dedicated rental units, we could yeah. make a dent. I'm, I'm not claiming that we're gonna make it cheap, but we can make a dent in the cost of rent by having more dedicated rental. But it gives you that flexibility. For sure, and that's that okay. first five years for a lot of us, even five to 10, right? Where we would rent and that's our first step. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just young people, lots of people rent throughout their lives. So it's, it's a win-win. We're serving a broad uh, section of the community. So that's kind of that first segment. The second segment is people who want to buy their first home, right? Mm -hmm. And now for most people, that's going to be a studio or one town bedroom ap apartment. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, no, the townhome might come a bit after that, you okay, know? So. Um, so, so most of the smaller spaces that we're building, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, they're in high-rise concrete towers and they're very expensive. Right. And so I think there's an opportunity in different parts of the city um, where we are adding density to add more medium and low-rise wood frame construction okay. and we do everything we can to give a bit of a lower price point for people to get into the market for the first time. Again, it's not easy, but there are things we can do to make it at least somewhat more affordable right. than the current high-rise cement towers. Um, and nothing wrong with high-rise cement towers. We need some of that You're housing type as well. Yeah, we, we need a more balanced okay. type of housing. So, so that'll get people into the market for the first time. Right. And then the third part is what you mentioned a moment ago, and that's family-oriented housing. And so, probably top five buzzwords that we're all going to hear in this election is family-oriented housing. Mm -hmm. So, for me though, the key is what does a candidate really mean by that? What, what do all of us? What do we really mean by mm -hmm. that? Right. And so the first thing is we need to mandate that in all new buildings, whether it's a high rise, a mid rise, a low rise, we need to have more three bedroom units and even some right. four bedroom units, right? We can't just- Those are hard to come by. They, they are, yes. yeah. So we need, we need to, to clearly ask developers, you know, we need more of those units in our, new, in our higher density housing. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is we need more townhouses and row houses, right? Uh, a lot of families now aren't gonna be in a position to buy a traditional single family home. So the goal for most young families that I talk to in our community 
is to get to that townhouse, that row house right. with three or four bedrooms, and that's where they're going to have their family. You can start that's, your family yeah, there. Yes. That's going to be your family home. So um, we really have a lack of supply on townhomes and, and, and row homes. So in South Coquitlam, we've hardly built any for years and years. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, we have built some in Burke Mountain, um, but we've built very few townhomes in South Coquitlam, very few in town center, and very few in North Coquitlam. And families, uh, Burke Mountain is a wonderful place to live, but families should have an opportunity to live in South Coquitlam or town center or North Coquitlam if that's what they want for them and their family. And so we need to bring that housing type to more parts so of the city. So you're looking at the different areas within yeah. the city and saying that there's um, different levels of catching up or yeah. adjustment that needs to For be sure. done. For sure. Not only do we need to shift to a more balanced mm -hmm. array of housing, it also needs to be balanced throughout the right. city, right? We can't just be putting people in one corner or the other based right. on housing type. building up one end of the city. Yeah. And we need to have options everywhere. Yeah. Right. So do you think, um, are we asking developers to contribute enough or do you think that um, developers should be, you know, maybe included in some of those options like below market housing or should there we be asking something of, of developers uh, absolutely so the the way i look at it right and i want to be really careful right we don't want to come out and criticize developers mm -hmm. developers are a really important partner in our community we need to build right. new housing we don't have right? developers <laughs> so yeah so my criticism is not right of developers it's right. the process and how it's been going and i think we can do a lot better um and so yeah the way i look at it i believe in leadership so right now often a developer makes a proposal right they work with city staff our staff does a great job but it's a it's a give and take with developer and staff to begin with then it comes to council and it's another give and take it's a long process and, and I'm not to be honest I don't support a lot of the outcomes at the end of that process and a lot of residents don't either In what way the, the mix of housing that okay. we get at the end right? right we're getting a very high percentage of small square footage high density and a very small percentage of housing is low and medium medium and low density larger square footage for families more livable units so I think instead of 80-20, we need to go to 50-50, something like right, that. Right, so that's a big that, shift. Yeah, there. and so yeah. I believe in leadership mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the city council table. So instead of waiting for these proposals to come to us at council, I think we need to have policies. So we need a certain percentage of three and four bedroom units, a certain percentage of below market and BCF right. affordable housing units. We need to give developers that leadership, that direction right up front, and then they know what we're asking for and what our community needs, and it'll actually shorten the time period with them working with city staff and then working with council. Ah, I see what you mean. So yeah. you're not negotiating yeah. back and forth yeah. trying to come to the a yeah. common understanding. Exactly. Okay. They'll start closer to mm -hmm. where our community wants us to end right. up. There's always going to be negotiation. The project has to work. But if they start closer to where residents want us to end up, it's actually going to be more efficient. And we right. will get we'll end up with development that residents support that meets the needs of our community. And it's actually going to be more efficient. And that even lowers the, the cost. cost. Only a bit, you know, it's only one part. Housing is complex, yeah. but it can lower the costs of new housing if that process is expedited by good leadership at the beginning. Okay, so along with development, of course, we're going to need to see amenities. Um, we can't yeah. just put people in housing and without, um, you know, consideration for the rest of how the community looks. Can you? Share some thoughts on, on parks and green spaces. Yeah. Do we need them in the city? Do we have enough? Yeah. Do we need more? Of course, yeah, and, and, and use the word amenities, and it's a great word, and it would be meant for me to be amenities and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of the concern I hear about our level of growth is, wow, like can, can our infrastructure, can our amenities keep up with right. this level of growth, right? And honestly, I think the answer is no. We've been growing so fast at such a pace um, that we simply can't, can't keep up. So I'll, I'll get to parks and green spaces in just a moment, okay. but I, I wanted to share a story from a resident I spoke with the other day in the New Horizons neighborhood. Sure. So there's two elementary schools um, in, in this one part of the New Horizons neighborhood. Uh, there's Nestor Elementary and there's Glen Elementary, a little bit more south. And so I spoke uh, with a mom who they'd saved up, they'd worked hard, they'd moved to that neighborhood. They get there, they live two blocks from the school but because we've brought so much new density to that area, even though they can see the roof line of the school from their front yard, her kids can't go to that school because it's full. Oh, wow. And that okay. show, and, and, and this lady is very upset, and for good reason. Mm -hmm. I could not agree with her more. Yeah. And so it just puts a real fine point on what happens when you grow too fast, 
too quickly, past your, too much. Yeah. yeah, our infrastructure and our amenities simply can't keep up. And then you have right. stories like that, right? And so, yeah, moving back to parks and green spaces, we're fortunate. I, I, I think most residents would agree, maybe top five best things about living in Coquitlam is our parks and green spaces. We live adjacent to unbelievable wilderness. Even within our city, mm -hmm. we have amazing parks and green spaces. But residents are aware when you go to town center, it's busy, it's crowded, yes. right? And I love that people are out, right? We gotta be careful how we say this, right? right? No, I and, understood. Yeah, and we, COVID, we wanna see people out there. For sure, right? Yeah. And COVID shifted, you know, one of the only, in a very terrible, terrible situation in, in, in two to three years, but one of the only small positives is that people got out more, mm -hmm. right? They shifted to more outdoor activities because we were all cooped up in our homes. Right, and, and we so need that's, to be social distancing yes, outside. Yes, and, and outside is, is much, you know, much less risk of transmission, is, for yeah. sure. And so that's a part of why we still have a lot of usage at our, in our parks and green spaces, and it's great. I support that. However, I talk to a lot of residents that say, you know what, like, it's a different feel. Things are different in our parks and green spaces than they were even five years ago, yes, right? Yes. And so that it's similar to the schools. It's not so much, oh, there's no room, but it really does, you know, make an impact. Um, so we just got to be careful, right, because we have wonderful parks and green spaces. Yes. And it's And it's something that might get missed sometimes it's really hard to acquire land for a new park or green space, right? Very difficult. The cost of land now is almost prohibitive. And so if we keep growing at this pace, right. I mean, the only thing that's going to happen is we're going to have more and more and more usage at our parks and green spaces. And there is a limit, right? There's a limit for enjoyability. There's a limit for safety. There's a limit for environmental impact as well. Yes, yeah. So before we start degrading the, yeah. the area. And, and yeah. to be very clear, like I am pro-growth. Yeah. but it's about how much, okay. right, and how fast. And mm -hmm. so we need to be growing and developing at a pace that is reasonable, that works with our current amenities and infrastructure, and as we upgrade, that we can keep up with. And most residents I talk to say, I think we might be doing a bit over that. So, okay. Yeah. Um, Paul, I have to talk to you about the environment. Yeah. Um, you've been really quite active and engaged in the community with respect to the environment. Can you share with us some of the things that you feel are priorities yeah. as far as, as um, you know, tree canopy, um, waterways, like streams? Yeah. What are our priorities yeah. in, in Coquitlam? For sure. So, um, yeah, I, I believe the environment needs to be right at the top of our priority list okay. in Coquitlam. Um, so there's lots to talk about, but uh, kind of maybe three key points that I'd touch on. So the first one is greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, the city of Coquitlam has adopted the IPCC targets right. uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43% by 2030. Um, what's a real concern for me and, and a lot of people I know um, is that we're growing so much that we're at real risk of not being able to meet those goals of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by that much by 2030. Because of the rate well, and it make, Yeah, and it makes growing. perfect sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I love new residents moving to Coquitlam, but we, we also have to do the math and the right. more, more people that come, the more housing that's built, the more cars that comes, the more et cetera, et cetera, right? So uh, there is, there's always a balance, right? We want growth, we want new residents, but there's that balance. So, mm -hmm. so it's just something that's really important that I think flies under the radar, that just the way we're growing is mm -hmm. putting, it, putting us at risk of not meeting those IPCC targets. And, and I think residents need to know that. Um, second thing, um, and, and this one is more, I think a lot of people do see this, is tree canopy. Right. Um, and, and that's throughout Coquitlam. So um, one of the groups I, I work with, it's called Protect Coquitlam's Urban Forest. And the goal is to advocate for tree canopy throughout Coquitlam. Right? regardless of what type, where, et cetera. And so you can break it down into three parts. Um, so in the south part of Coquitlam, our neighborhoods there are very established. Oh, so so get bigger, yeah, bigger old Yeah, trees. so it, one of the neatest features mm. of south Coquitlam uh, is you have tons of mature coniferous trees and it's beautiful. And, and it's a real feature of our community. Um, the second thing, we're having a ton of development throughout the city. Right. Um, so when you have development, you lose some trees. Now, again, we need some of that development, don't right. get me wrong. But I think, again, we need to have a balance. So right now, we're clear-cutting every lot. I think we can leave some on the property line. I think we leave some in the courtyard. There's opportunities to leave more mature trees, making sure they're safe, wind-resistant, right. but with new development. And I think I got a little ahead of myself there. So just going back to South Coquitlam, we're experiencing a lot of tree loss in South Coquitlam. So we don't have any hard data on this, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but our tree canopy probably peaked somewhere in the 
90s or 2000s, and then it's been declining in South Coquitlam since then. Uh, the number reason, number one reason, would be turnover, demolishing old single-family homes and building new ones, developing higher density. Yeah, and, and again, re older homes sometimes yeah. come to the end of their lifespan, right? Yeah. But then, it, so it's about the how we're doing it, and and so most lots are being clear-cut in South Coquitlam, and some of them had a lot of beautiful mature trees on them. So I think again, that's where we can leave some on the property line in the front yard. We can have a balance. Be more thoughtful about. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to just clear-cutting every lot. So, so can you just talk for just a minute for people that maybe aren't aware? Yeah. Um, besides being beautiful, yeah. why why do we care about a tree canopy? Yeah. Like, why is it important for us to try and protect and retain yeah. those for big mature trees? For, for sure. And and I'm not saying this in necessarily order of priority, but right. the number one comment I hear from most residents is they just love what it does to their neighborhood. You said the word beautiful, absolutely, but character, right? It really changes the character of a neighborhood. Right. I, I was just out in a neighborhood last night and I was just, wow, what a lovely place to be, right? Who doesn't want to walk under the trees? Yeah, and, right. and without those trees, it's just not as nice, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for, for a large percentage of residents, it really is about that feel, that character, right? Um, but then, yeah, if you move on to the, the, the clear benefits, the environmental benefits of trees, um, the, the number one is shade, for, for right. sure, right? So when we have a heat wave like we had last year, it's going to make a huge difference in your yard and even in your home if you have shade over your roof, right? And this and this gets missed. Um, really, really important for uh, wa uh, drainage, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, and this will lead into kind of my number three key point on the environmental side of things, which is, so trees absorb water. They reduce the speed at which water hits the ground, their roots absorb it, etc. Everyone knows, you okay. know, tr trees live management. off, <laughs> right? well, and that's the phrase, right? Yeah. So, 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 yeah, greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction, number two, um, excuse me, um, is tree canopy. And the number three thing I wanted to highlight is what you just said is stormwater management. And a lot of residents it might be the first time they heard this phrase. Mm -hmm. So it's something that kind of flies under yeah, the radar. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely about, does. Right? And it's one of the key things that affects the health of our streams and rivers and watershed. So it's all connected. Yeah. You know, you're talking about waterways. Yeah, and, exactly. So okay. so it, it's probably one of the most nuanced issues, but mm -hmm. that really matters. Yes. So all stormwater means, if, if people haven't heard the phrase before, uh, really is the quantity and speed with which water leaves our neighborhoods and enters our creeks and rivers. Mm -hmm. And the speed and quantity with which it enters determines the health of those streams and rivers. So before we had, you know, lots of development everywhere, the water would go into the ground and it would gradually go into the creeks and, and rivers. Now it goes into a storm sewer, storm sewer and just rushes in. Right. And so we need to have drainage, obviously, throughout right. our communities. Um, but it's going so much and so fast that it actually harms the streams and rivers and it directly harms our fish stocks and, right. and our salmon stock, right? And so uh, stormwater, yeah, it's just way more important than people might think. And the good news is it's pretty feasible to come up with a solution. So there's some really good engineered solutions we can come with, come up with in our city drain, drainage system to slow down the pace. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't reduce the quantity. If it rains a lot right. one day in November, well, what there's nothing the we water? can do about yes. that. But we can slow down the pace with, with, it, okay. with which it enters streams and the Coquitlam River especially, because that's where a lot of our salmon mm -hmm come right. up to spawn, but they also spawn in Scott Creek, you know, all the and different the smaller, creeks and tributaries. Yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, stormwater might uh, fly under the radar, but, but it's very important, yeah. Okay, um, I'm getting the signal that our time is almost oh, no. ready. <laughs> yes, and we still have so much to cover. I just want to touch, um, and I'm sorry, I'm just going to pivot no, no, onto no, another no subject no because problem. I really want to no, hear no, your, no um, we know that small businesses yeah. are really important or I think they're important to Coquitlam. For sure. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Why are they important and what can you do as a city councillor to encourage more yeah. small businesses no. to come in. Th no, for, for sure. And like I said earlier, I think balance is so key. Okay. Balance in our housing policy, balance as individuals, balance as candidates. And so, yeah, business is very important, right? Um, we have to have a robust economy to make sure we have a great society. So, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, so my job is working with small businesses, helping people start a business or coming into a business, helping them with problems or to grow. Um, so we need to have a great business environment in Coquitlam. Right. Uh, so a key metric for businesses is always cost. So we've got to be really careful with our property tax levels for, oh, okay. for, for businesses. It's a, it's always a top concern for mm -hmm. businesses. Um, regulation is, 
it's funny, you hear about regulation and red tape and it, it almost becomes a cliche, right. but to a small business owner, it is not cliche. Right. And so I think we need to have the fastest systems possible. I was talking to a business owner the other day, he had bought a business, so it was a transition period. It took him several months to get his new business license. Oh. Should have been a few weeks tops, you know? We want businesses to be serving our community, not worrying about paperwork, or waiting for things yeah, to happen. Yeah. So, so you think there's some efficiencies that... For, for sure. So we got yeah. we got to be very careful of okay. our business tax rate, uh, and we got to be yeah make sure that our regulation we have good regulation, but things things are efficient, uh, and then we also got to be really careful with rent for for businesses. Right. So so a lot of small businesses in Coquitlam are struggling with the increase in commercial rent, right. um, and it, it's it, it's a greater conversation, a lot of detail, mm -hmm. but but the city needs to be aware of that. Um, sometimes we need to be careful in not rezoning and tearing down too much older commercial space too quickly because that's going to put a lot of small businesses out of that more affordable space and their business model might not work or their, their margins are going to change significantly and they're going to pass those prices on to consumers. So we got to be careful with the pace we do that but then we also have to make sure that new housing, new development I should say, has a real significant percentage of commercial space mm -hmm. to give those businesses a great place to go and to make sure there's enough supply so that the cost of commercial leases doesn't keep climbing and climbing and climbing. With yeah. more supply, we can stabilize that a little bit. No, so I know we're running out of time. I so. <laughs> can see where your business background, like I can see so many aspects coming in that um, would provide really valuable <laughs> sort of um, decision-making um, abilities, right? Like you've got so much to draw on. Um, our time is running out, no but problem. I have one more question that we like to talk to everyone about this, yeah. and it's respectful workplace. Yeah. So, you know, when you, um, if you get onto city council, you'll be working very closely with people that um, might not always agree with you, and, yeah. and there might be issues that become contentious in some cases. How would you um, deal with those like what skills and and what sort of approach do you bring that would help you? Um, navigate that sort of yeah, situation for sure So I try to be a friendly positive guy So, you know today we talk about some challenges mm -hmm. that we have in Coquitlam and and some criticism coming from the community um, But at the end of the day, yeah, I think it's about having a great positive uh, attitude um, But honestly having a great rapport with people, mm -hmm. you know And and I think we always got to remember and I think we're pretty fortunate in Canada uh, It doesn't always go this way politically but I think as a country we're, we're quite good especially the world over and we can disagree but we can do it with respect right? right so my approach is you know even though I might disagree with one or other of the other counselors uh, the key is having that great rapport a good relationship but being honest sticking right. to your principles but always having that great rapport and that way I don't think things will ever go negative and toxic right because right. we need to have a debate in Kukulam right mm -hmm. there are real concerns in the community that aren't being represented yeah. so we need to have a debate we need to have these conversations um, but it needs to be respectful well thank you so much Paul I think we're gonna um, wrap things up there and I just want to say very sincerely thank you for coming in you've shared a lot of information and shown us I think what you could bring to City Council so thanks for taking thank the time. Thank you Nancy I appreciate that so much yeah mm -hmm. thank you and, and thanks to everyone for watching and Octo on October 15th if you consider voting for Paul Lambert I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you. So th thank you to Paul Lambert for joining us today. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. Thanks for watching.